Hey guys, welcome back to the Audio Hawks YouTube channel. I'm Gene Della Sala, and today we're here with Shane Rich, Technical Director of RBH Sound. Awesome to have you here again, Shane, to educate our peeps on speaker design. Yeah, good to be here, Gene. Looking forward to our conversation. Yes, yes. We don't know where it goes, but we know it goes somewhere. <laughs> so, you know, I think what we really want to talk about today is driver topology in loudspeakers, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of a thing that people look at a speaker, they see a bunch of drivers, they don't really know what's going on. Mm -hmm. So if we start out with a very basic design, like this speaker right here, it's just this is just called a two-way or an MT. Uh -huh. One of the yeah. most popular speaker designs on the market, just a woofer and a tweeter, right? Mm -hmm. Then you've got a three-way design, which is a woofer, mid, and a tweet. Mm -hmm. Then you've got an MTM, and technically an MTM is still a two-way, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Uh -huh. But why is it that MTMs, and that's when you have a woofer, a tweeter, and then a woofer, why do they get very little love in our industry these days? What do, you, what do you think the reason is for that? And why do you still use them in almost all your products? Well, that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure why they don't get what I think they deserve in terms of you know that particular design, uh, the kind of love you're talking about, because uh, it's my favorite. Um, you know, it's been around for a while and it's, you know, years ago, it was actually, I guess, a little more popular, but now it seems that uh, the industry has sort of moved more towards having a three-way design, uh, specifically for uh, center channels and even smaller, you know, speakers. Uh, it may look like an MTM, but it may be a two-and-a-half-way design or even a three-way design. So I, I think the advantage, the natural advantage of a two-way design is you just have one crossover point. And anytime you go beyond that, if it's a smaller speaker especially, you're just interjecting some issues as far as uh, phase between drivers. And uh, there's some things that that brings to the table uh, that are just not really beneficial uh, when you're trading off from driver to driver to driver. There are some speakers out there that are, you know, four or five, six way designs. Uh, <clears throat> I personally have never really uh, appreciated or gravitated towards those types of designs. I've just never heard anything that sounds the way I think a speaker should sound with that many crossovers in it. Well, just for a frame of reference, you're actually a musician. You play, you know, trumpet. Uh-huh. That's true. So you have a pretty unique uh, frame of reference here. You know, you listen to a lot of non-amplified performances. You've been oh, in yeah. non-amplified performances. Yeah, and I think that's really important, especially for speaker design. Uh, sort of the holy grail is that you want a speaker to reproduce um, its source signal so that it sounds like a live performance. And the instruments, especially acoustic instruments, sound natural. In other words, a violin should sound like a violin, not a right. viola. Uh, a clarinet like a clarinet and not an oboe and so <laughs> forth, you know. So I, that's been sort of my frame of reference, uh, having, uh, you know, had a lot of experience in uh, musical groups. So I, I think that Ultimately, that's what I use with our product design to, to really judge if the product is sounding the way it should, as if it can reproduce natural instruments um, and they sound like they're really there in the room. Yeah, you know, I've seen a lot of speakers, and I'm talking like the trophy speakers, the really big ones. Mm -hmm. They'll stack it with a bunch of sub drivers, like 10 inch mm -hmm. or 12 inch drivers, and then they'll have a single five inch mid range and a tweeter. And I'm like, mm -hmm. well, now you're basing the design of that speaker. Its dynamic capabilities are now limited to that one mid range, right? Yeah. Covering yeah. that whole band. Yeah, so it isn't just frequency response or tonal aspects of the speaker, but it's, yeah, the dynamic capability of the speaker and the total dynamic range you have across the band of frequencies that certainly makes a difference and especially in these days when you know home theater is is so big and uh, uh, most systems are used in sort of a dual purpose role for right. home theater and music listening now do you think like an example like a Status 8T, that's, just, mm -hmm. that's your current flagship speaker. It actually mm -hmm. has four mid-range drivers in an MTM uh, configuration. Mm -hmm. I find, even at low volume levels, 
like instruments just sound much larger and, and more effortless, even though the speaker, if I compared it to a two-way and neither speaker is distorting, you can measure it and the distortion looks good. To me, having a speaker with the multiple drivers, to me, sounds more effortless. It has to do with something, maybe the way it's playing into the room. Well, certainly. Um, the amount of cone area that's playing into the room, but I think there's sort of a sweet spot or a range that uh, really works best even for larger speakers because if you have too many drivers in a room um, that are reproducing the same frequencies i have heard some speakers like this you have as well yeah. where you've listened to a speaker system that's just a huge line array of drivers and we're listening to uh, maybe a small uh, chamber group uh, or a guitar and the guitar sounds like it's 10 feet <laughs> tall you know an uh, acoustic guitar where it just it and so it doesn't yeah it just still doesn't sound natural so I think you have to have uh, enough um, cone surface area to preserve the natural dynamics of the instrument and yet not go too far beyond that or you start uh, imposing an improper scale to what you're listening to. You're basically creating an artificially large vertical sound stage, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. So why is it like on an 8T, um, I keep coming back to the speaker because it's right there and I'm looking at it. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, it's got the four mids, MTM. Why didn't you bandwidth limit the far two mids? That's kind of textbook design. You don't want to have those mids playing the same frequencies as the inner mids because then you yeah. can get acoustical interference. Well, I'll be honest with you, when I, we originally started in on this design, the thought had crossed my mind to experiment with that, and I did a little bit of experimentation with uh, bandwidth limiting, but I, I didn't get into it very far before I realized, wow, it's just, it's not the same sound as ha sticking with that traditional two-way design mm -hmm. uh, that just seems to work so well again not having any of those phase anomalies that uh, you experience when you go to uh, more crossover points in a speaker and especially in that critical band of mid-range frequencies where they're just that much more discernible uh, if you're really listening and so um, I was kind of surprised myself at how well it worked initially uh, by having all four mid-range drivers cover the same band of fre frequencies, but I was sold on it, uh, no question, after very little experimentation. Well, you also, to some extent, you control the vertical dispersion of the speaker. Oh, definitely. Well, right? Absolutely. It, it certainly factors in, helps in that regard, where you have uh, fewer floor and ceiling reflections, uh, you're getting more direct sound mm -hmm. from the speaker at the listening position versus reflected sound. I gotcha. Now, what about the principle of taking an MTM and putting it horizontally? I know that it's been a bad reputation in the industry. We even have an article that shows on and off axis measurements and how a three-way design off axis actually measures better than an MTM off mm -hmm. axis. Mm -hmm. But then I also did a secondary article showing that basically um, with a conventional MTM, if it's designed well, you could go up to almost 30 degrees off axis and still have uh, very minimal lobing yes. problems. And in most home theaters, you're sitting 10, 15, 20 feet away. If you're uh, more than 30 degrees off axis, you're probably sitting next to a sidewall, which is a bad seat anyways, because you're near a surround channel. Mm -hmm. So I guess I kind of answered my own question, <laughs> but at the same token, what is the advantage of, of keeping it a two-way as opposed to doing a three-way with a smaller mid underneath the tweeter? Yeah, well, you really hit it, uh, uh, the nail on the head. It has to do with, again, dynamic range of the speaker system uh, where you have two drivers that are reproducing that same band of frequencies. If you can do that without some real loping issues, then why not do it? You know, why not give your speaker that kind of output so that I, I don't think we really, unless you've heard a, a speaker system that has a wide dynamic range, uh, you know, and you're used to just generally listening to a very small speaker, um, you, you don't know what you're missing. Yeah. Uh, you've got to experience that. And so I know it's a design trade off. Uh, readily accept that, but that's the direction we've chosen to go because, it, again, if you're not really far off axis and you design the speaker, 
you know, correctly and have a good crossover design, you're going to have minimal lobing issues within that, like you said, 20, 30 degree uh, range of uh, off-axis response. And so you, you have all the benefits of having that additional dynamic range, uh, lower distortion levels, and um, it, it just makes it a different experience from mm -hmm. being limited to a much smaller mid-range driver um, you know, if you're designing, unless, like you said, you're sitting way off axis, or you have a very large room, and not that there aren't cases where you would want to have a speaker with uh, more dispersion off axis, but in most cases, people sit within that, you know, 15 to 20, maybe maximum of 30 degrees off axis, and. Uh, so it's just not necessary to go to those extra steps, and it can be detrimental to to have that you know three way design. Well, plus you also on some of your products you also um, elevate the tweeter up higher, and you bring the two mid ranges closer. Yeah, again, designing you know specifically for that type of speaker, center channel speaker, where we're again trying to minimize the lobing. Uh, you know, have a crossover point that's low enough that you're. Getting uh, you know the kind of frequency response off axis that's going to have the best sound ultimately. Right. Well, you know another thing I like to talk about are surround channels, um, dipole versus bipole. Um, you know a lot of people really aren't using dipole these days because mm -hmm. now we have discrete surround sound. Mm -hmm. You don't want to necessarily spread that sound too far out anymore. Back in the days of ProLogic we didn't have that convenience. So we mm -hmm. had to kind of make it sound as if it was, you know, a wider sound stage there. What are your thoughts on that? Because some of your products are bipole, but you still have some products that have a uh, tweeter out of phase, like in a 66 SE, but the mids are in phase. So it's a bipole dipole. Right, and it simply is the tweeters that are uh, out of phase relative to each other. Again, the, the mid woofers are in phase, functioning as a bipole. Uh, and it really has to do with the axis of best integration between the tweeter and the mid range. Uh, when you reverse the phase, you're either uh, getting that ideal axis of integration angled up or it's angled down. Oh, okay. And so uh, for rear, or for uh, a speaker that's functioning as a surround speaker that has two baffles. One of the baffles, uh, the ideal angle of integration might be above, and so you're getting a little more diffuse sound above towards the back of the room versus uh, the baffle that's angled more towards the listening position where you have the ideal angle of integration below the axis of the speaker and therefore you're preserving more of that direct sound to that position. Interesting. So while we're talking about angling sound up, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts about making a little Atmos speaker where you fire it to Cybertron and hope that the Autobots come down and rescue you? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as you know, uh, our feeling is if you want to do an Atmos surround speaker, the best way to do that is by putting this uh, speaker in the ceiling and actually having the sound come from that location versus trying to bounce the sound off of a surface area to have it come from that location. So, um, If you want sound in that location, put the speaker in that location yeah, because correct. anytime you try to bounce sound, you can't do it at the low frequencies because they're more omnidirectional, right? Right. You're going to have propagation loss going up to the drywall. Even if you have flat drywall ceilings, most people don't. Most people have vaulted ceilings or, you know, it might be too high. I mean, there's just too many variables in our opinion as well yeah. to properly do an Atmos um, configuration with reflection technology. Right. So I'm kind of glad that you guys are sticking to your guns and, and instead of promoting more speakers, promote the right kind of speakers before you start adding more than five or seven channels to a theater. Yeah, correct. It's yeah. it's quality, guys, not quantity. Yeah. yeah, that is our feeling exactly. Now, I will tell you guys, we listened to their demo at CD. It was a 7.2.2 <laughs> demo, and for their Atmos channels, they only use two channels. They only use two speakers. They used a bipole speaker, and I thought it was fantastic. You put a watt in the middle of the room, right, on the ceiling? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so. And because of the dipole nature, you created a much more diffuse sound field. It almost sounded like there were four speakers. It was very even coverage across the two rows of seating.
Yeah. And again, it, I'll be honest with you, it was an experiment on our part. It's the first time that we have uh, done a an Atmos system with those particular speakers, uh, but we decided, hey, let's let's see how this works because there actually is a method to the madness there, given the radiation pattern of that specific speaker and the way um, the two the two uh, baffles are actually uh, sort of offset or they mirror each other. One is is giving you more uh, dispersion uh, towards the uh, the screen and the other one's giving you more dispersion towards the back of the room mm -hmm. as well as uh, the angle on the speaker which is giving more direct radiated sound towards the listening position than another baffle which was uh, more off of the wall the side wall so it was more of an ambient effect but it, it really was very good we were very pleased with the result we were getting you know I just thought of a product idea for you guys while everyone's bouncing sound around why not make a speaker that's pivotal pivotable up at the ceiling where you have one set of drivers going this way and the other set of drivers going that way and you could kind of create four speakers out of just yeah. two pairs of speakers yeah. well this, product idea yeah a really good idea actually and and uh, especially if you're trying to cover a broader uh, listening area where you have several rows of seating, uh, then you know that, that could really be a benefit. Well, there you go, guys. Groundbreaking technology here. We just came up <laughs> with a new product. I get the first samples, of course. Of course, as you always do, Gene. Yes. <laughs> Appreciate that. Well, guys, that's it. Um, you know, do you want to ask our readers any questions while you have their attention? Um, pose it to them and they'll give you some responses below. Well, I would say uh, if you're considering a speaker system, what is it that you're looking for uh, most in that speaker system? Um, if you're shopping, researching, what is it that you uh, would be your ideal system in your mind? And of course, there are a lot of different products to meet a lot of different needs, but Let's hear what you have uh, on your mind as to what you think would be the best for your particular system. So price, performance, aesthetics, pick two. There we go. That's <laughs> great. All right. All right, guys. Well, until next time, keep listening. <laughs>